Presenter, Chris Balder. Chris Balder taught linguistics for 25 years in the UK, first at the University of Nottingham and then at York St. John University, where he held a professorship in linguistics. Now, retired, he holds a, an honorary professorship at Stratford uh, University. Uh, he has published a number of books and more than 60 articles on functional linguistics, computational, and statistical techniques of language study corpus linguistics, uh, especially applied to the study of English and uh, Spanish. Okay, today he's going to talk about research methods in linguist linguistic study. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Uh, can everybody hear me at the back? I prefer not to use the microphone, if possible, but um, is that okay? Can you all hear me at the back? Yes. Okay, just, just shout out if you can. Okay, um, in the eight hours that we've got together, what I want to do is to talk about ways of looking at language for various purposes. But as you see from the title of this first presentation, the particular emphasis of the seminar is going to be on quantitative, that is, largely statistical techniques. <clears throat> but I thought it would be a good idea to start off by looking at the broader range of techniques that are available for the study of language. And indeed we're going to start with not the qualitative side, sorry, not the quantitative side, but rather the qualitative side of things. You may wonder, well, you know, if this course is about statistics, why are we going to start with something to do with qualitative studies? Well, that's because what I really want to do is to compare the two approaches. I'm not an expert on qualitative methods. There are people who are going to be teaching on this seminar who are much better equipped than I am to talk to you about the qualitative side of things. But I wanted to give you an idea of the ways in which qualitative researchers work in order to contrast that with the ways in which quantitative researchers work so that you can see the differences as well as possible similarities between the two. The two kinds of technique, it's not a question of one being better than the other, rather that uh, you can combine them in fact if you want to, as we'll see later on, but rather that they're useful for different kinds of study, with different kinds of data, with different kinds of aims in mind, as we shall see. Um, those of you 
who um, signed up for the whole course should have a set of handouts in which I've given you all the PowerPoint slides that I'm going to present throughout my eight-hour slot, so that you can then write notes on them or whatever. One thing before we start, um, statistics is the kind of area where if you start to get lost, yeah. ah, right, okay. So, how do I? The mic. Do I have, to, I have to use the? I press the button. Yes. Is that all right? Is that better? Right. Okay. Could be that I, if I move away slightly, it will uh, it will not get so good. And stuff. Okay. Um, yeah, st statistics is the kind of subject where if you start to get lost at all, then it matters a lot because it's a cumulative kind of thing. We're going to be building progressively uh, on your knowledge of this area and on the techniques involved. So please, if you start to get lost, if there's something you don't understand, please say so, right, so that I can go over that point again. Otherwise, you're likely to be lost at the next stage. Okay, um, I'm not myself a trained statistician. I'm not a statistician by profession, I'm a linguist. But I don't think that's a bad thing in the sense that um, people like me, I think, are in a better position to know what kinds of problems there are for people coming from arts backgrounds involved in the study of language for a variety of purposes, the kinds of problems they have are probably easy, more easily appreciated by somebody um, with a background in linguistics than they are um, by someone with a background in statistics. So my job, really, for this eight hours is to try and get you to think statistically, to understand the basic features of statistics, the underlying things that you need to know in order to appreciate the differences between different techniques and so on. So by the end of my part of the course, you should have a good idea of what statistics is all about, how to start thinking in statistical terms. You should have a good idea about the fundamental principles behind statistical work. and you should also have some idea of um, appropriate kinds of technique and test and so on um, that you can use for any data that you might have. Now, of course, in eight hours, I can only present a very basic course. But those of you who will be able to go to Constantino Arte's talks uh, will also have a backup in the form of uh, exercises that will be given to you on the kinds of things that I should be talking about. And also, uh, Constantino will go further than I have in certain areas to present to you um, certain slightly more advanced techniques that I don't have time to cover in an eight-hour course. Okay, so let's begin. Three types of methodology broadly speaking, qualitative work, quantitative work, and mixed in that, as we shall see, it's sometimes quite a good idea to use both qualitative and quantitative approaches in your work. So let's begin with qualitative methods. Don't forget that I'm not here trying to get you really well versed in qualitative methods. What I'm trying to do is to present something about qualitative methods in order then to contrast it with the quantitative approach. My main source of information for this, which you might like to look at if you're particularly interested in these approaches, is a book by um, Herm and Croker, and particularly the introduction to that book in your handouts, you should have um, not only an introduction to the whole course, but also a list of references, an annotated list, 
<laughs> this should be on that list. I think it's a very uh, good initiation to the qualitative type of work. So what's the underlying approach? Well, qualitative work is basically constructivist. What do I mean by that? Well, that it doesn't start off from the point of view that there is something out there, some reality out there, that we're setting out to describe. So there's no universally agreed reality that we're trying to relate to. Rather, reality is something that people construct for themselves. It's socially constructed by individuals in interaction with their particular world at the time. So this, I think, is a really quite important idea behind qualitative research. That we're not saying, okay, I know that there's this meaning out there somewhere, I'm going to describe it. We look at how meanings are constructed by individuals in interaction. And work of this kind is often exploratory. In other words, the aim is to discover new ideas, new insights, rather than to check existing hypotheses. And that's one of the big contrasts between qualitative and quantitative work. So what sorts of things are investigated? Well, the qualitative researcher will often be interested in how the participants in whatever is going on experience some particular phenomenon and interact with it, and interact with other people at some particular time and in some particular context. In other words, it's often quite specific kinds of work. You'd be looking at a particular person or group of people doing particular things and at some particular time. Qualitative research assumes that there isn't just one valid view of the world. There are perhaps as many views of the world as there are people. That it's, you, you assume multiple ways of looking at the world. You don't assume that everyone in an interaction is having the same experience. Exactly. Interpreting things in the same way. And very often, what studied is what we might think of as everyday worlds in natural settings. In other words, studies of people at work, studies of people at play, studies of people studying um, would be possible. Everyday kinds of activity are very often the object of study. And as you might expect from this kind of approach, where we don't assume some kind of external reality, but accept that people construct a reality, then you might assume that subjective meanings and understandings are going to be particularly important. What does this particular participant in the interaction mean when they say something, when they do something linguistic? And the idea behind it is to understand what's going on in an interaction rather than in measuring some kind of outcome. Quantitative work measures outcomes. Qualitative work basically tries to understand what's going on. So what kinds of questions do qualitative researchers ask? Well, a very general one. What's going on here? You know, somebody, a qualitative researcher might be lurking at the back somewhere uh, of this auditorium and might be studying what's going on now. Now, at, at present, this is a monologue. I hope it won't re remain a monologue all the time because I hope that you will be asking questions and making comments, but this kind of question that they will be asking was, well, what's really happening here? What does the world 
or this particular bit of the world look like to the participants? What's their viewpoint on it? What's what they're thinking about it? What kinds of meanings are the participants constructing? There's not just one kind of meaning. We know that there are all sorts of meanings. There are meanings to do with what we're referring to. There are meanings to do with the social interaction between us. Anybody who's read any Halliday will begin to recognize the sort of tack I'm taking here. Um, there are meanings to do with making what we say and write coherent. There are all kinds of meanings that we can study. What's the influence of the setting? How might what I'm saying change if we were in the bar discussing you know, qualitative methods instead of here, in this rather more formal setting? And quite an important feature here is that very often a qualitative researcher doesn't set out with some very specific research question in advance. That's another change we're going to see when we look at quantitative work. Often, the qualitative researcher will define the research purpose. It's not a free-for-all. And there'll be some kind of conceptual framework within which they're working. But they won't usually set up concrete hypotheses which they want to test. You notice that I'm peppering my talk with words like usually because obviously um, there are exceptions to, to everything. What kinds of qualitative work have been done? Well, um, one sort of inquiry would be what's, what's called narrative inquiry. In other words, getting people to tell you their life stories or the story of part of their lives, what they did in, when they were at work, for example, or, or in the family. Case studies, in depth, in other words, um, qualitative researchers often study a, quite a small aspect of something in great detail. So, case studies of one person, or perhaps of very few people, a single institution, a particular context, and so on. We will often find um, great detail, as we shall see in the example I'm going to give you in a moment. There's what's called linguistic ethnography, where the researcher tries to identify patterns in a group that shares some particular culture or subculture. And the example we're going to look at in a moment is of this kind, this linguistic ethnography. And finally, there's what's been called action research, <clears throat> which is research which is intended to have a practical application of some particular type, for example, research which might help teachers to improve the way they teach. So what about the data and how people collect data for qualitative work? One way is observation of participants in some particular setting. So you get a group of people who are working on some particular task, for example, and the researcher then could act purely as observer, distancing themselves from the, um, the participating group, or the researcher sometimes can try to become one of the group. Now, as you might imagine, that can involve a lot of prior work, trying to get to know the group, uh, what sorts of things they do, how they work, and so on. And so these are two um, poss different possible ways of going about it. Then there are interviews, which can either be very structured, where the interviewer asks particular questions and then gets the, the group to reply, or they can be more open, when, where the, um, the, the group or the subject is, in, is encouraged to uh, open up to talk about uh, various things. Questionnaires, often with open response items, in other words, items that invite people to elaborate 
on Sunday. And also, verbal reports. For example, you can get people to try to say what they are thinking as they do some particular job, these sometimes called protocols. Or you can ask people to keep diaries of what they've been doing and to look at those. So that's just a sketch of the kinds of things that qualitative research can be about. And what I want to do now is to look at a particular example. Now, please remember that the idea is not that we should discuss this particular example for its own sake, or that you should necessarily understand absolutely every bit of it. Rather, it's intended to illustrate some of the things that I've just been saying about qualitative analysis. And it's a paper by an old colleague of mine called Ben Rampton, who some of you may have heard of, on linguistic ethnography and interactional sociolinguistics in the study of identity. For those of you who would like to read it, if you find it interesting, that's the reference, which is on the sheet. So what Ben Rampton is trying to do here is first of all to give an account of what linguistic ethnography is and what interactional sociolinguistics is. He starts off talking more generally about those two areas. But then, as an example, he investigates data from classroom interaction. And ben collected a very large amount of data on tape videotape um, in a London school, and what he's trying to show is what's happening. Remember the question, what's going on here? But in the particular context of social identity, social class identity, how is what's going on contributing to um, putting across a particular sense of class identity? And in particular, what Rampton's looking at here is the use of particular um, voices, particular accents, and so on, which are associated sociolinguistically with particular classes in, in London. So he finds that the children sometimes use exaggerated posh accents, upper class voices, and so on, or they may go to the other extreme and use vernacular Cockney London accent. On the handout that you have for this particular lecture, you've got the data that we're just going to look at briefly. So what I'm going to do is just take you briefly through the data, if you can um, look at that on your sheets while we're going through. You all found it? Okay. Just a bit about the participants and setting, first of all. We've got Hanif, who's 14 and of Bangladeshi descent. We've got Aaron, who's 14 again, of Malaysian descent. And we've got Simon, 14, of Anglo descent. And the setting is that they're sharing the same table in a science class in their school in London. So what does Ben Rampton say about what's going on? Well, in lines two to four of the transcript that you've got, Hanif is asking Aaron what he's doing. Straightforwardly. But then, in line six, you've suddenly got Hanif warding off an, an, an intrusion by another speaker. So the other speaker trying to get in on Hanif's territory, and Hanif manages to hold the floor. And then in lines eight to nine, you've got a reproach. And then it switches in line 10 onwards to actual work in the classroom. Hanif now turns to the worksheet that they got to work on and then reads the title of the worksheet aloud, but 
and Brampton thinks this is important, he, when he says the words galaxies, he says it with an exaggerated cockney diphthong at the end. In other words, this is one of those occasions on which Hanif deliberately adopts an accent which he doesn't normally adopt. An exaggerated cockney accent. So what's Rabbiton's interpretation of this? Well, he says that in line 11, Hanif seems to be talking to himself, but that in fact, he's orientating himself towards overhearers. In other words, what he says is intended not just for himself, but for those who can hear him as well, although he's not talking directly to them. And, Brampton says, it displays what ethnographers call a shift of footing. In other words, what he's doing here is changing over from talk to friends. So far, it's been really talk to, to, to the to the kids that are there as friends, but now he signals the beginning of his engagement, and hopefully theirs as well, with the task that they've got to perform in the classroom. And Rabton points out that broad cockney is very often associated with a kind of informal sociability. So he's at the same time as, as Hanif is trying to swap over to looking at schoolwork, he's also showing that he's still, as Rampton puts it, in tune by using this exaggerated Cockney accent, um, which is a marker of social informality. If you look at a lot more of the data, you find that this exaggerated Cockney pronunciation turns up again, and what um, Rampton does is look in detail at what's happening at each of those points, socially speaking. For example, at one stage, <clears throat> he, Hanif uses this very cockney OK with that particular uh, phonetic pronunciation. And the idea here is to get Simon and Aaron, the other two members, to actually attend to the next question on the worksheet. So it's a signal, hey guys, look, we've got to do this now. But at the same time, maintaining his social relationship with them. And in fact, Rampton provides details of the 37 hours of data collected in relation, all of this, to questions of social class identity. Okay, so there's an example for you. I tried to find what I thought was a fairly typical example from somebody I actually knew, and I knew the sorts of work that he did. And you can see, perhaps, how it exemplifies those features that I was talking about, at least some of them. How he's looking at how the kids in the classroom are trying to construct their individual worlds. And trying to signal, in this case, social class identity by means of quite specific, uh, in this case, largely phonetic devices. Okay, before we move on, have you any questions about anything that I've said so far? As I say, I'm not an expert on these qualitative methods, so I hope your questions aren't too difficult. But, um, is there anything you'd like to, to observe, to, to, to add, so far to all this? As if not, we're going on to the quantitative side. You all right? Could yes, you, yes. Um, if, you're, if you're observing a group of people, are they adapting their language because there's an observer? Do they know this? And how do you account for it? Are, are they adapting the language because... Because there's an observer. There yes, is yes. I mean, it's, it's the old observer's paradox, thing, isn't it? And, um, this, I suppose, is one reason why qualitative researchers sometimes try to integrate with the group, first of all. Um, it would be somewhat difficult to do that if you weren't a 14-year-old uh, student, I think, in, in many ways. But, um, yes, that is always a problem, and one that I think the qualitative researchers are very much aware of and, and try to, to compensate for in whatever way possible. 
Yeah. Yeah, you've shown us, um, well, first of all, thank you very much for uh, making qualitative study worthwhile, <laughs> although you are more uh, focused on quantitative work. Yes, yeah, sure, um, it would be very useful. But you've shown us an example that takes about five seconds of interaction and there's 37 hours recorded in that video material. So my question is, talking of research methods, how does the researcher go about that? Obviously, you've got to go through the whole material got, and isolate each yeah. single example. Yeah, so there's, talking of research, there's a lot of... Handwork. It's right. very data intensive, it seems to me, very time intensive. That's what, the, one the, of the characteristics. That, that's right. Prior you, to the quality analysis. Sure. You, you really have got to go laboriously through very large quantities of material, picking out instances of the particular tiny thing, important thing, the small thing that you're interested in. And, and that's something that um, statistics and things like that cannot help at all. No. Not, not really, not really useful. Just reassuring, okay. <laughs> okay so. um, the other thing is, you also mentioned um, data collection methods. Yeah. And my question is, for this qualitative study, um, would you include something else to account for work in historical studies? Yes. Because mostly the focus here is on the oral and the contemporary language. But True. people working with historical, uh, in historical periods of the past, um, written data is good data, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely, yes. I mean, there, there we agree is, on that, yeah? There, there is this, this tendency, I, I think, uh, in qualitative work to, to, use, to use spoken language um, a lot. But yes, looking at, all, looking at records of written language would also be very important here. Yes. Thank you. By the way, um, the, the, the data intensive, labor intensive kind of thing that you were talking about, and a, a parallel in my own kind of field would be corpus linguistics, where quite often you need to search through enormous amounts of data. They're presented for you in a way which facilitates that, um, but you still have to go through and all do all the donkey work of finding the examples, and that is, takes a long time. I think it's one of the things that has put a lot of linguists off corpus linguistics because it takes such a long time and it's frankly it's quite boring just going through the examples but it's worth it in the end because you do get some very rich data and the same I think would be true. Okay, let's move on then to quantitative methods and again all I'm trying to do at present is to give you an idea of what this field looks like and how it's rather different from the qualitative. The data are basically numerical. Now, that's not to say that you're collecting numbers. What you're collecting is something to do with language, right? But they will be processed um, with numbers. And that's also um, the, the difference between qualitative and quantitative is shown up, I think, quite clearly here, that with quantitative work, you often have quite precise research questions that you want to get answered, rather than the more open-ended approach of the qualitative research. And particularly, you need to set up hypotheses for testing. Now, hypotheses are ideas that you want to test, if you like, but they have to be, they have to be phrased in such a way that they're very clear so that you can actually test them. Right? A lot of people's hypotheses initially are far too woolly, far too general to be properly testable. So one of the things you have to get used to in quantitative work particularly is formulating your ideas very precisely so that they will be testable. And in order to get valid conclusions from numerically based studies of language, you need statistical techniques. And part of what I want to do this morning is to show you why that is. Why do we need to bother about statistics at all? I hope you'll see that by the end of the morning. By the way, I'm very much aware that there may be people here who've done quite a lot of statistics before, 
And if you have, then my apologies. I, I, if I see you go to sleep, I shall assume that you've done some statistics before and are just bored. But it's always good to have a bit of a refresher course, I think, in something like this anyway. And probably most of you, I imagine, are at the stage of saying, well, I think it's important and I'd quite like to have a go, but I'm not really all that confident. You know, this is the kind of things that people say to me very often about this area. Right. Can't, I can't emphasize this one enough, that in order that your statistical work will be valid, you must have an appropriate research design. No amount of sophisticated statistics will help you if your research design is bad. You have to think carefully about how you're going to design your work before you actually start collecting data and before you start doing the statistical analysis. And we'll be talking about research designs as well. All that, you see, is really rather different, isn't it, from the qualitative approach. There are various points of contrast there. What sorts of things can we investigate? Well, anything in linguistics where you have data on how often things occur, how long things take, for example, how long a vowel is in a particular word, how long people take to react to particular sentences, for example, if you're asking them to do something with them. Scores on tests, you'll find a lot of the examples that I'm going to discuss are to do with scores on tests in applied linguistics. Anything where your data consist of numbers of things, really. And as for um, the areas of language study that you can use this in, well, they're almost anything, really. Any level of linguistic organization, and from various perspectives. So you can use statistics in theoretical work on language, in descriptive work, in sociolinguistics, very common there, in psycholinguistics certainly, and in applied linguistics in the more um, restricted sense of um, things like language teaching. And so, so it really can, the, these techniques really can be used very widely, and part of what you need to do as we go through this course is think, well, how would what he's saying apply to the sorts of things I'm interested in. Okay, so you need to be thinking about what kinds of data you have collected or would like to collect in your own work and how particular parts of what I'm going to say might be relevant to that work. So what can we do using quantitative methods? Well, one thing we're going to look at this morning is reducing a whole set of data which can consist of lots and lots of numbers that you, the things that you've measured, reducing that to a set of values that summarize its main characteristics. If you simply got 100, 200 numbers, you can't initially see any pattern in them. What you need to do is reduce that to something manageable. And one of the first things to do is to say, well, What's the average value? Let's say you've collected scores on a test from 100 students. You've got a list of 100 numbers. Okay? So one thing you can do is calculate an average value. And I'm deliberately using this non-technical term average for the moment because there are different kinds of average that we're going to look at. We can also look at the spread of values. You might find that on a test marked out of 20, um, one or two students get ones, twos, threes, fours, very low marks, and others get brilliant marks, 19s, 20s, and so on. And most of them will be spread in between. So the dispersion or spread of the data, which you'll we'll also find is very important in statistical work. Not just the average, but how are the values arranged around that average? Is the range a very wide? So that's for a particular set of data that you might have collected. But you can also compare different sets of data. For example, 
you can find out if the average value for one particular set of data is bigger than or smaller than the value for the others. Say so you'd collected um, scores from a group of 100 uh, male students of a language and 100 female students of a language, you wanted to know if there was any significant, statistically significant difference in their average scores. That's again something we'll be looking at. An example I've given you here is um, slightly different. We could ask uh, a native speaker of English to say the word beat, or a set of informants to say the word beat, and we could also ask them to say the word bit, and we could measure the lengths of the vowels in each of those words, and then we could use a, st a statistical test to say, well, is the vowel in beat significantly longer than the vowel in bit? We should find it is, because the rule is um, to do with the kinds of vowels that you've got. What else can we do? We can discover relationships in data. For example, we can look at what we call correlation. If you've given a class a reading test and a writing test, is it the case that if some particular pupil gets a high mark on reading, they're also likely to get a high mark on writing. Do high marks in reading go with high marks in writing? Do low marks in reading go with low marks in writing? Okay. Are they correlated? You might even find that people who do well on the reading test do badly on the writing test. There would be an inverse correlation. Right. We hope that probably wasn't the case, but maybe. Another thing you can do is predict which of a set of variables significantly predicts the scores that you get on something. A concrete example again. You've given people a particular language test, and you suspect that various things are involved in how good people are in this test. Perhaps one of them is the sex of the individual. Another might be their degree of motivation in language learning. Another might be their aptitude for language learning. Okay, so you know you have measures for each of the people. And you obviously know what sex they are. You have measures of motivation and aptitude as well. Using statistical testing, you can find out whether sex or motivation or aptitude or some combination of those predicts significantly the scores they're going to get on the test. And you might find that the most important factor is whether they're male or female. You might find that the most important factors are a combination of motivation and aptitude, and so on. Okay? And finally, sometimes people collect lots and lots of data according to lots and lots of characteristics. An example we're going to look at later on is the work of Douglas Biber, um, who c collected an enormous range of texts and measured an enormous range of things about them, linguistic characteristics of them, and then tried to see which characteristics were associated with which texts and with one another. And there are techniques that I hope to be able to illustrate to you briefly at the end of the time I've got with you for discovering patterns of that kind. So those are some of the things we can do with quantitative methods. I want now to distinguish between two kinds of quantitative study that are quite important, I think. First of all, experimental studies. And these are studies in which you as the researcher are in charge, as it were. You're in charge of varying the values of something you're interested in studying 
and then measuring the effect on something else. Right? So um, let me give you a non-linguistic example for a change. Uh, somebody who is interested in uh, finding out how drugs uh, affect a patient, a particular drug affects a patient, might give the patients particular doses of that drug to see what the effects are. Obviously there are ethical issues involved here as well and so on, but in, in a drug trial that's what you might do. We, we know what the safe limits are, obviously you don't go beyond that, but you might try different levels of the drug and then measure the effect of the drug. Now, the thing that you're interested in, the level of the, uh, the drug, is the independent variable here, and the reaction, what comes out at the end, if you like, is what we call the dependent variable. It depends on the level of drug you've administered. So a linguistic example might be, you expose people to a sentence on a board for a given um, amount of time, but you vary the time for which the sentence is made available to the people, and you ask them to recall the sentence accurately after a certain period of time. So you're investigating the effect of time of exposure on ability to recall. Okay? So time of exposure would be the independent variable, ability to recall would be the dependent variable. The other kind of study is what is sometimes called observational or descriptive studies. And rather than you being in charge, you, rather than you being able to alter things, what you're doing as a researcher here is to look at the relationships between variables in naturally occurring situations. You can't do anything about them, you have to accept what's there but you can look at the relationships between them. So you might be interested in a particular vowel pronunciation in a particular region of a country, and you might be interested in working out which particular vowel pronunciations are associated with males more, and which with females. Now you're not altering anything, You've got a set of males and you've got a set of females. You collect data from them and you look at how they pronounce this particular vowel. You're not altering anything. There's no dependent or independent variable as such. All you're doing is looking at the relationship between those two variables. The sex on the one hand, the um, kind of pronunciation they use on the other. Yeah? And that would be an observational step. We're going to come back to all these things in more detail later on, but for now, I want to do what I did before and give you an example of a quantitative study. And here again, let me remind you that we're not trying to get to grips specifically with this study and criticize it or whatever. We're using it just as an example of the kinds of things that quantitative researchers do and comparing it perhaps with the politics. So again, if you don't follow absolutely every bit of it, it doesn't matter. The important thing is to see what they're trying to do and how they're trying to do it. It's a recent paper on the role of phonological decoding in inferring word meaning in a second language. Here's the reference from the journal Applied Linguistics. Now, what does this rather complicated title mean? What they're looking at is people's ability to extract phonological information. That is, information about pronunciation, basically, from printed words. So if I showed you a, a nonsense word that conformed to all the rules of English, okay, uh, if I showed you that in the printed form, would you be able to use that to decide how that word was pronounced? 
Okay? That's basically what we're talking about. And these researchers wanted also to know whether there was a relationship between the ability to do that, the ability to decode the written word phonologically, and the ability to infer the meaning of the word. And they were doing this for two groups of learners, ESL learners. So it's quite a complex design. You've got two groups of learners, you've got um, the phonological information being extracted, and you've got the meanings being extracted. So what were their hypotheses? Remember that quantitative research uh, involves the setting up and testing of hypotheses a lot of the time. They hypothesized that ESL learners that had alphabetic L1, first language, orthographic backgrounds, okay, whose, whose L1 language uh, was an alphabetic orthographic system, these people would decode the phonology of English words faster and better than learners that had logographic backgrounds. Remember, you know, you all know the difference, don't you? Logographic um, has, a, has some sort of pictorial symbol, uh, uh, whereas alphabetic, well, we know about alphabetic anyway because you speak an alphabetic language. They also hypothesized that people's ability to decode the pronunciation from the written form would be correlated with their ability to infer the meaning of the word if they didn't already know. And that that would happen in students with an alphabetic background, but they thought that probably students with a logographic background would not be able to do this so easily. In other words, that having an alphabetic background helped students not only to decode the phonology, but also to extract meaning. Who were the participants? There were 15 native speakers of Korean and one of Turkish. Korean here seems to be being treated as an alphabetic language, um, which is fair enough, I think, because if I remember rightly, the symbols are composed of phonetic components, um, it, so it's, it's, it's classed as alphabetic. And logographic, 13 native speakers of Chinese and 4 of Japanese. Japanese uses Chinese characters quite a bit, but it also, of course, uses syllabaries. Now, what did they do first? They didn't simply jump in and do their experiment. They did all sorts of things beforehand. And this is another thing that is quite characteristic of quantitative studies. Before doing your proper study, you do all kinds of other things first to make sure that your proper study will be valid. So, first thing they did was to get scores on a reading test of English as a foreign language from all the students, irrespective of their background. And then they compared the alphabetic students with the logographic students to see if one group did significantly better than the other. Now the way of doing that is the test which is known as a t-test, which we'll talk about later on. Don't bother about it for now. But what they found was that there was actually no significant difference between the two groups. And this is exactly what they wanted to find, right? Because what they were checking was that there was no difference in their reading ability. If there had been a difference in the reading ability of the two groups, there wouldn't be much point in carrying on, because you've got a contaminating variable there, which would upset all the results. So now they're sure that that's something they can forget about. Right? They also assessed what they called the working memory capacity. If some if one group is overall much better at remembering things than the other, then again, no point in going on. Because that might account for anything that you find. So they again did a test. This time, this time it was a digit memory span test. You know, you give people a string of numbers and ask them to pick them back. And again, the statistical test showed no significant difference between the groups, so they were okay. 
And they did what we call a pilot study prior to doing the main tests. In other words, they took just a few students, presumably different students, and tried the tests on those students to try and iron out any difficulties. Then they could adjust the tests before doing the main study. That again is something that very often happens in the quantitative study. Okay, so what did they actually do? First of all, they had a naming task to measure the phonological decoding efficiency. Now, don't worry about the details of this. It's not important at present. But what they did was to present all the students with a group of 40 words, 20 of which were real English words, and 20 of which were pseudo-words, in other words, made-up words, but words which did obey the rules of English. And they randomised them, okay, so that there'd be no effect of all the It's another important thing. And they gave them a practice session, first of all, and then the participants were asked to read the items aloud as quickly and accurately as they could, and the researchers measured their response times for each word. And they take a call of the readings. Now, what about the meaning influence task? There, what they did was to um, change passages, passages of English. These were passages describing what they, were called, what they called folk objects from an ESL textbook. But they modified them so that ten words which occurred in all three passages were replaced by a nonsense word, right? Uh, 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 something which wasn't a word of English but could, could have been, with no more than two syllables and seven letters each. So you've got ten words um, common to all three passages replaced by non-words. Uh, words that had similar meanings, like start and begin, for example, were regarded as the same target word. And they also made slight changes to various syntactic structures so that the students wouldn't be bogged down in all kinds of complicated syntactic structures. Notice that what they're trying to do all the time is remove anything that could interfere with what they're really interested in. Yeah? They even changed some lexical items to simpler symbols. And then the test that they had to do was to read the passage first of all, give a brief oral summary, but that was just so that they would get into the habit of thinking in terms of comprehension. And then they were given 10 minutes to write down what they thought was the meaning of each of these funny non-words, these pseudo-words. So they're trying to guess from the context and from the spelling of the word and what it might be. And they scored the accuracy um, by reference both to the original words, um, if, if they got the original word, obviously that was a high score, and also definitions given by native speakers who were asked to perform the same job. So what were their results? We didn't bother too much about their techniques. The, the results are interesting. And again, you have a very careful approach to uh, how the results were, were obtained. They had two raters, okay? Two people were asked to assess the accuracy of phonological decoding. They were told to take foreign accents into account. And the researchers measured what's called the inter-rater reliability. In other words, they checked that the two raters were giving roughly the same ratings to a particular individual. How consistent were the two raters in rating these decoders? Again, that kind of thing, trying to check for consistency, is fairly um, typical of quantitative work. They looked at the response times of the accurate responses, and they used 
a technique that's going to be mentioned later. I'm not, I'm not going to have time to deal with it in any detail, but I think probably Professor Arthur will, um, called analysis of variance. Don't worry about the name at present. But what they found was that there was indeed a significant effect of the orthographic background on the ability to decode the uh, phonology. In other words, as they had predicted, the alphabetic group was better at doing this than the logographic group. And that effect was statistically significant. Now, that's a term that I'm going to have to um, explain to you in some detail later on, but just accept it for now. They found also that the type of word was significant. People um, responded much more quickly to real words in English than they did to the pseudo words. You remember there were 20 of each. I don't think that's very surprising. As far as the meaning inference was concerned, they compared the meaning inference scores of the two groups by means of one of these t-tests again, but found no significant difference. In other words, the alphabetic and logographic groups are performing equally well when it comes to inferring the meanings of the words, right? Which is not what they expected in the first place. They also did tests of correlation. Do you remember what that is from a bit ago? When high values on one thing go with high values of another, for example, and low values with low values of another. And they showed that word meaning inference did cor correlate significantly with the ability to decode the pronunciation. Remember that was one of the, of the hypotheses, that the ability to decode the pronunciation would help in decoding the meaning. But that only happened for the alphabetic learners, not for the logographic learners. So in summary then, the difference in the orthographic system of L1 does affect the ability to decode the phonology. Real words are processed more efficiently than pseudo words for both groups. And word meaning influence is not significantly affected by whether their background is alphabetic or logographic. And then they went into the explanation phase. Having got their results, they tried to account for them. Why did it turn out this way? And they suggested that um, logographic learners, for example, may rely less on the phonology uh, in trying to assess word meaning and it, than, than the alphabetic ones do. And that, that's one conclusion from that work. Or, indeed, the two groups may be using quite different techniques to try and get at the meaning of the word. I think perhaps that's another version of the first one, in a way, that um, the, the alphabetic ones are using the phonology as a way of getting at the meaning, but the logographic ones have to apply some other kind of technique to do that, contextual or whatever. And also, finally, that because there was no strong correlation between decoding of pseudo words and anything else, pseudo words are probably processed differently from real words, which is hardly surprising given that a real word conveys real meanings, but a pseudo word, of course, doesn't convey a real meaning. Now, I said right at the beginning that it wasn't a question of one kind of technique being good and the other bad, but rather of different techniques for different purposes. And I think what I've said so far will, um, will bear that out. But sometimes, it's a good idea to use both. For example, um, if you're looking at some particular aspect of language learning, then you could give the students questionnaires, treat it qualitatively. You could, of course, give them questionnaires of a kind which um, ask them to give numerical answers and then treat that quantitatively. But you could also give them proficiency tests of one sort or another, and then treat that set of data quantitatively. 
So there's nothing at all to stop you combining qualitative and quantitative techniques where that's appropriate. Right, that's it for that particular um, presentation. Now, so let me just recap. What I've tried to do is show you some um, major characteristics, as I see it from what I've read, of qualitative methods, and then the same for quantitative methods, but also pointing out the differences between the kinds of approach, and also saying that they can be combined. So what I've said about um, quantitative methods should now set you up all right for going into a bit more detail on that in the next presentation. Now, we're running to time, more or less. Um, if we don't go straight on, then I suppose we probably won't finish. So are people feeling that are you feeling that you can go straight on? I mean, if we had a 10-minute break or something, that would throw out the timing considerably, I think. Are, are you still all right? How do you feel like? How do you feel? You're saturated? Or do you think you can go on until 12 o'clock and then go and go have a very strong coffee? <laughs> you all right? I can ask yeah. you a question. Yeah, of course, yes. Yes, by all means, by all means. Uh, well, you said that the results of this particular study were uh, talking about it in example, were statistically significant. Yeah. Now, my question is, uh, are they statistically significant for that group or for those groups? Because uh, there were only 15 students in each of the groups. And uh, the million dollar questions we might talk to students when, when they, are, they are doing research, they ask what how big does the population have to be in order for, for, it, for the results to be reliable? And right. so, okay. can we say that 15 is a good number? Or? No, you can't. I mean, there are ways of, of assessing, and we won't have time to deal with it, unfortunately, but there are ways of assessing roughly what size of sample, not, not population, but sample yeah. you need in order to we have a good chance of getting uh, a significant result if it's not to be found. Um, often, you are completely um, hidebound by the, the practicalities of the situation. Often, you only have 15 students, yeah. right? Yes. And there's nothing you can do about it. There are things you can do. You can make sure that all the other aspects of your investigation are absolutely squeaky clean, you know, that they're absolutely um, right, that you've removed all the extraneous factors that you possibly can, um, but 15 isn't very many, you will have to take that into account in, um, in, in the actual statistical testing, which will take that sample size into account when it does the calculations. But you may well find a non-significant non result with 15, because the sample simply isn't big enough, right? You may find that if you did it again with 30, you would get a significant result. Because the bigger the sample, the better. And there are ways of estimating how many you need. Can't, I, I really can't go into that now, because I mean, that, that's, that would, would be too complex and um, would take us too but long. There are but there are, there are ways of doing it. What I would suggest for anybody who um, wants to go further into this, 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 this very good book by Field that's on your uh, handouts, Andy Field um, has a book on statistics with SPSS, which is what we're going to be, what they're going to be doing. And um, it really is a very thorough introduction to statistics as well as um, to, to SPSS. And you'll find answers to that kind of question. But there are there are ways in which you can do that. Thank you. Yes. I don't know if this fits in to ask this, but when you talk about the another test being used, yeah. um, the first results, um, do the other sample they have an like independent variable has to to group the three groups because they are alphabetic and non alphabetic subjects, so I don't really understand. Right. Um, or are what? they considering they have Chinese, Japanese, and 
That's what I mean. What, what they had was three groups of, um, no, they had two groups of students, didn't they? Yeah. Um, they had two, how oh, many tests? Japanese and Chinese students. That, that's why. What you've got is, is what's called a factorial design, where you've got a number of variables that you're looking at. And that's one of the things you can, can do with that. No, but, but I, I, I understand because of what you're talking about, yeah. because I know that it's normally used uh, where there are at least but three groups. Where there are at least three groups. Yeah. Yeah, we'll come on to that okay. later on. Arthur, um, a, a, a word I often come across as an editor journal is significant. Um, would you agree that the word really now should only be used by um, academics if it means statistically significant? There are two kinds of significance we can talk about and which I will be talking about in a bit. One is statistical significance, which simply means um, whether you have shown that there is, to, to a certain degree of confidence that is, you will never be totally certain, that there is a real difference in the properties of the two groups or whatever it is, uh, in the populations from which the samples were drawn. Okay? Now, that does not mean that the effect that you have found, if you get a significant result statistically, it simply means that the test has been able to, to show that. But it doesn't mean that the effect that you have measured is necessarily significant in the everyday sense of the word, that it's important, <coughs> that it's a large effect. For that, you need to calculate something called an effect size, and that tells you whether your, what you have found, whether it's significant or not, is actually big enough to be worth considering important. Right? So the two have to be kept separate. But I will be going into that a bit later on. Okay, so okay. My, my question is a practical one. Okay, we understand that the bigger the data we have collected yeah. is, the better. Yeah, we, we all agree with this. But what happens, for instance, if I want to analyze 10 tests? Let's say 10 news items on 10, 10 stories. This is not a big date, okay, I understand that. Mm -hmm. But imagine that I want is to identify the kind of processes that I can that are used by the writer in this text. I mean it's not a big, big data, but can I carry out qualitative and quantitative and yet I have a analysis or a statistical analysis? I mean I know that the data is small, but perhaps the statistical analysis that we will carry out later will well, help me to Yeah, you, you might well be able to because what you what if if what you're interested in is, for example, let's take a concrete example that I know you work on, um, types of process in the clause, material processes, relational processes, yeah. mental processes, and so on. Now, if, you want, if what you're interested in is the distribution of those processes in the text as a whole, yeah. taking all ten together, yeah. then yes, you can, because you're going to have a lot more numbers of processes than just ten. Okay, yes, the things you're actually measuring are going to be measured perhaps in the tens and hundreds uh, yeah. and so on. And that's what matters, really, right. there. So you, your population is not just your population of ten texts, it's the population of material processes. Or no, they want to be texts. But what I mean, it doesn't matter that, I mean, if it is not 1,000 or 3,000 or 20,000, if we are talking about 100 or 200, we can carry out the then, then, then you're, likely to, you're likely to be in the area where it's okay. But as I said, there are ways of, of trying to see um, how big a, a sample you might be. Please. Yeah, I would like to, to have your opinion about the, the a practical problem, how to integrate numerical data into a theoretical framework. Yeah. <coughs> Because it's very common to come across different studies in which you have, for example, a couple of paragraphs or a couple of pages in which you have a theoretical opinion about the topic, and then you have an appropriate and, and I would say a very good statistical uh, study, but at the very end there is no a real connection between both sections of the paper. Right. So this is. Uh, 
in your opinion, do you think that when we try to explain the, the data, the numerical data, we have also to include different uh, theoretical, in, I would say, approach in this theoretical approach, or we have to differentiate both sections? Well, I would hope that the statistical testing would arise out of the theoretical points which were, were being discussed. So that the, the theory would give rise to the hypotheses. The hypotheses would then be tested statistically, and then the interpretation would relate it back to the theory. I mean, that, that's the ideal, I think. Not, ev not everybody uh, does that successfully, but that's how we see it working in the best of all cases. Okay, can we go on? Otherwise, I think we're going to run out of time. Um, <clears throat> what I'm going to do now, if I can find it, I'll go back to the best. Uh, is, is take you a bit further. This is a sort of incremental process, as I said, said before. What I'm going to do now is a sort of question and answer session. I'm going to look at some questions which beginners in quantitative work often have and try and answer them for you. Okay, so I hope these are questions that um, have arisen or would arise in your own minds when you thought about this more. So, the really big question is why do linguists need statistics at all? Well, to do quantitative work, obviously, if quantitative work is, um, is what you want to do and it's appropriate. But also, you need it, you need a knowledge of statistics in order to be able to read the literature. Because there is so much literature now on a variety of aspects of language study that actually use of statistical techniques. And in order to be able to evaluate those studies, those papers, you need to know what they're talking about. So at least you need a, a kind of passive knowledge of, of statistics to a certain level in order to be able to um, criticize that work and see if it's, if it's solid, solid. Do all linguists need statistics? Well, if you're a bilingual Chomskyan formal linguist interested only in competence, then possibly not, although um, Chomskyan people have, have actually um, used statistics rather more, I think, over um, the past few years than, than, than might have been the case before. But I'm just saying really that there are kinds of linguistics where statistics is not all that important, including a lot of the qualitative work that we've been talking about. But many people do need it. They need it, first of all, if they're interested in linguistic variability. Statistics is all about variability. Really. It's, it's really necessary because language, like many other aspects of the world, is not a single homogeneous monolithic entity. It's variable. It's variable in all sorts of respects. So there are linguists, of course, like sociolinguists, people interested in text types and so on, whose business is actually looking at linguistic variability. But here's the perhaps more important point, the first one was obvious. You also need statistics in other kinds of work that isn't inherently to do with variability in language, because you need to take account of that variability in making decisions about what you found. You need to take account of the effects of variability in your data in your statistical testing. We shall see how that works. This is something that people often say or, or think. Um, well, you know, it's all, it's all very well if you're, if, you, if you're a scientist, if you've gone up to a scientific training, but, you know, I'm, I'm a poor arts researcher, aren't I? Mean, I I can't get into all this stuff, it's, it's far too difficult, so why should you? Well, yes, some kinds of statistics are indeed associated with um, a scientific approach. I've talked quite a bit about the setting up and testing of hypotheses, which is a pretty scientific thing to do, I suppose. But, even if you're not 
involved in what we call hypothesis testing. Simple descriptive statistics can often be useful. Things like averages, things like the degree of spread of your data, things of that kind, can be very useful things to present in a paper or a report, even if you're not going on to test differences between groups and so on. So it's worth knowing something about that area, um, even if you don't intend to go any further than that. And also, it must be pointed out that um, statistics isn't simply associated with the more scientific types of linguistics, you know, like phonetics and, and, and psycholinguistics and so on, which people think of as being more in the science-based areas. It's also very important in sociolinguistics, in discourse analysis, work on language and gender, etc. So don't run away with the idea that it's only things like phonetics and psycholinguistics where this is used. So, what kinds of things can you do using statistics? I've already said something about this, let's go through it quickly. We can describe and summarize sets of data. We'll see how to do that. We can take samples from a population. I'm going to be looking at those terms in more detail. And we can try to see whether the samples that we have, um, that we have drawn from the population We've tried to see how representative those are of the population as a whole. We can check whether the hypotheses that we've set up are valid or not. Hypotheses about relationships between sets of data. And I told you about, for example, Douglas Biber's work, which uh, looked at a large number of linguistic characteristics and a large number of texts. We can investigate in a rather open-ended sort of way the relationships among the different variables. Now I've been using these terms data and variables, I've been throwing these around, I've been sort of assuming that you knew what I mean. Um, let's be absolutely sure and define them. Data in this particular context are just measurable or countable observations. So anything that you can count, frequency or time of something, scores on a test and so on, anything that can be measured um, can count as data for a quantitative approach. And a variable is simply some property or other whose values can vary, as you would expect. Something that you're interested in whose values can vary. So number of words in a sentence can vary. The sex of an informant, male or female. Length of a syllable, in terms of either, well, however you do it, in terms of um, phonemic units or whatever. Score on a language test. A rating for the coherence of a text. You might, a text. You might get um, teachers to rate the coherence of texts produced by um, Spanish students of English, for example. So all those would be examples of variables. They're things that you want to study, which are measurable, and with whose values can vary. Now, here's something which I think is quite important. Um, and at this point, I ought to tell you that people who do statistics often disagree on certain aspects of what they do. And this is one of them. The question of levels of measurement and how important they are is something on which different statisticians tend to have somewhat different uh, views. So I'll try and reflect that in what I said. Variables can take different levels of measurement. And this is really quite important, I think, because you need to know about this in order to decide what measures are appropriate and what tests are appropriate. It's one of the things you need to know about. So let's go through the levels of measurement that have been proposed. Some variables have what are called a ratio level of measurement. So, for example, we've measured the lengths of a vowel. If a vowel is 20 hundredths of a second long, I don't know whether that's a reasonable figure, 
then it's twice as long exactly as a vowel that has a length of 10 hundredths of a second. Right? You can take a ratio between the two and it makes sense. They're measured on a scale with equal intervals of <coughs> time, and there is an absolute zero. In other words, zero seconds, or zero milliseconds, or whatever it is. So those are ratio variables, and they're the highest level of measurement. Technically, there are also things called interval variables. They're measured on a scale with equal intervals, but don't have an absolute zero. Now, there aren't many linguistic examples here, so it's not important to us, but certain temperature scales would be an example. But the next difference is important, I think. Ordinal variables are ones where you can rank the different <coughs> things that you've measured. You can put them in order, that's what I mean by ranking them, but they're not measured on a scale with equal intervals. Imagine, for example, let me give you an example from, from um, some work I did for my PhD. I asked people to rate for politeness different sentences in a particular context. So I might give them sentences like, um, could you open the window? You must open the window. Um, would you open the window, please? And so on. Read out with consistent intonation patterns and so on. And then I would ask them to rate those on a scale of politeness from 1 to 7, where 1 was very impolite and 7 was very polite. This sort of scale is sometimes called a, a Likert or Likert scale. And strictly speaking, and you'll understand in a minute why I say strictly speaking, you've got a scale here which is not one with equal intervals. Would you really want to put your hand on your heart and say, that if somebody rates a sentence for politeness as a 6 out of 7, that sentence is exactly twice as polite as one that's rated a 3. No, I don't think so. Right? Um, it's, it's making it too quantitative, as it were. Same with coherence of text. If I ask you to mark a text out of 10 for coherence, and you say that it's an 8, then that text is going to be exactly twice as coherent as something with four. Um, I once heard, and this is real, uh, a, a TV advert which said that um, something like that, that uh, uh, a certain beauty product in, improved your beauty by 71% at least. <laughs> is beauty the kind of thing that you can measure on such an accurate scale? I, I think not. So those are ordinary values. And finally, you have nominal variables where all you can do is count how many there are of them in particular categories. So it's where you can classify things into mutually exclusive groups. An example would be gender, wouldn't it? Sex. You can classify people as male or female. You can classify tenses, depends on the language, but that's for the sake of argument, say past, present, future. Okay? And any particular verb form is going to fall, we hope, into one of those categories and only one of those categories. Just as any student or informant is going to be either male or female. So that's a nominal variable where you can only categorize. Sometimes they're called categorical variables. Categorical variables. Just a, a word of warning, people sometimes talk about things like ordinal data, um, Strictly, they refer to variables, but we often talk about things like interval data, ordinal data, etc. Okay, later on we're going to see why that's so important, and also the fact that certain statisticians um, minimize the importance of some of those differences. What's a hypothesis? Another term that I've been bandying around, but that I need now perhaps to define. It's really just a prediction about the relationship between or among variables. Like, girls will perform better on this test than boys. How do you set up a hypothesis? Well, I mean, some people just lie in the bath and try and think of nothing, and things come to them, you know. I mean, this, this is a perfectly good way of generating a hypothesis. <laughs> However, 
more usually, you've done some reading and you've listened to people talking about things at conferences and stuff. And, or you've read, you've done pilot studies. Remember the pilot study and the, the quantitative uh, thing that we talked about? That would be a good reason for setting up particular hypotheses for your main study. You normally set up a hypothesis on the basis of what you already know from the literature, uh, from pilot studies, etc. But as I said very early on today, it's very important to state hypotheses explicitly in such a way that you can actually test them. You'd be surprised, you may think that's, that's obvious, but you'd be surprised how many times you find people um, stating hypotheses which don't stand any chance of being tested because they're just not specific enough. You, you have to really get to grips with what you want to find out and express it in a very clear way. Some examples of hypotheses. Here's one about dialogue between males and females who are native speakers of English. You might hypothesize that the number of interruptions per unit time will be higher for male than for female speakers. Males interrupt more than females. Or, of course, the other way around for that matter. Or just that there'll be a difference. All those would be hypotheses. Vowels before voiced final consonants in monosyllabic English words are longer than those before the corresponding voiceless consonants. Bead and beat, for example, okay? The vowel in bead before the voiced consonant tends to be more, it tends to be longer than that before the voiceless consonant. That's another hypothesis of a different kind. Here's one from the Applied Linguistic Area. Um, students taught French by means of a particular video based course will perform better on the language test than students taught by a purely audio-based methods. So you set it up so that you teach one group by video, one by audio, you measure their performance in some way, and you try to show whether one is better than the other. <coughs> okay, let's stick with that French course for a moment, because I think we can use it to illustrate an important You've done that. You've, you've taught them one group by video, one group by um, audio, and you find that in the exam that you give them, the test, the video group gets 62% and the audio group gets 58%. Job done. No? You've done it, haven't you? You've um, have you proved your hypothesis. Video group's got more. 4% more. Is that what you wanted to know? Well, not really. Not really. An unwise conclusion. Why? Because all you've shown is that for your samples, the video group does better. Right? And that's not what you really want to know. What you'd like to know is whether students of the kind that you've got in general perform better on the video and the audio course. You're interested really not just in the sample you've taken, but in the whole population from which that sample was drawn. Now I can't emphasize that point enough because it is a really important one. You take samples because you have to. You can't test everybody. Your grant money won't allow you to test two, three, four thousand people. And in any case, even two, three, or four thousand people isn't everybody you could have tested. The, the, the potential population, if not infinite, is extremely large. So you have to take samples. Well. But how do you know that those samples faithfully represent the whole population that you're trying to study? And that's why you can't just conclude that if your sample done with video gets 62 and the other one gets 58, then okay, the video is better than the audio. If you chose another group of people from the same population, you'd find a different result, certainly, and it might be that the audio one did better. That's basically why you need statistical testing. Okay? What you're interested in is the whole population 
of possible course takers, not the South itself. Note, by the way, that the term population here is being used in a very precise, technical way. I mean, we usually think of populations as being populations of people in cities and so on, or maybe rats in sewers or something like that, but they're populations of, of animate beings usually, or maybe even trees and those. But the population in statistics is much wider than that. It's simply the whole lot of things that you're really interested in. It could be the population of words in the works of Shakespeare, for example. Still with the French course, then. If you take another sample, will it give you the same results? Almost certainly not. Why? Because populations are inherently variable. <coughs> there are all kinds of things um, that vary in those populations, some of which you may have been able to minimize by careful choice of, of students, but there are lots of things you probably won't have been able to, to, to correct for. You know, their, their aptitude, their motivation, their, probably their degree of exposure to other languages and so on, that, that kind of thing. All sorts of things that could be um, accounting for the variability. Now, if you get a very, very big difference, say the difference between 40% on, uh, on the audio and 80% on the video test, uh, the video um, course, then you can be pretty sure that you've got a real difference. Differences of that kind almost don't need the statistics in order to, um, to show that you've got a real difference. But <coughs> not very often you get huge differences of that kind. The real question is, is 58 versus 62 big enough to conclude that there's a significant difference in first of the census I was talking about in response to Lapland's question, is it big enough to show that the difference, that there's a real difference in the populations from which the samples were drawn? And only a statistical test can answer that question for you. Right, here we go. You can never prove the hypothesis to be true unless you've examined all the possible data, not just a sample. Statistics is about probabilities, about how confident you can be. Right? You can never actually prove a hypothesis to be true unless you have actually examined your whole population. So if you were interested in the works of Shakespeare, you could you could, theoretically, look at absolutely everything he ever wrote, the whole population, and then you would be sure about what you found. But in real life, <coughs> it's not usually like that. Um, let me... Uh, have, you, have you come across um, black and white swans in examples at all? Mm, yes. Uh, Popper. Oh, Popper. Philosopher of science. If you want to um, put forward the hypothesis that all swans are white, right, you can go around the country and go around different countries collecting examples of swans, and yes, they're all, they're all white. So have you proved your hypothesis? Well, no, because the next one you come across might be a white one. And you can never be sure that there isn't a black one lurking out there somewhere. And a single black one would strictly be enough to demolish your hypothesis. In practice, we have to be more realistic than that, um, but technically, that hypothesis has fallen as soon as you find a black swan. You can never prove a hypothesis unless you've studied all the swans in the world. Perhaps not even then, because what about future swans? And swans, that, <laughs> swans that already passed on to swan heaven. There may be a black one lurking there somewhere, so no, it's, it's not as simple as that. You can never prove a hypothesis, really, definitively, unless you look at all the data. Sometimes, anybody, you can't look at all the data. You can look at all the words in the works of Shakespeare, I suppose, if you want to, but you can't um, look at even 
probably all the people who were born and bred in, in, in Santiago in a project. It would simply be too much, let alone a too big a place. And there are some things that are in principle impossible, because if I ask you, for example, to say the word beat um, 30 times or something, okay, I could get you to go on saying that until you drop dead with exhaustion, couldn't I? Or I could get somebody else then to take over and say it when, 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 when you've heard that. It, it's not possible, really, to, to say that that's a, a finite population you can carry on, carry on collecting the time. So, statistical testing, then, is a matter of being relatively rather than absolutely sure. And we shall see how that works. So, by this point, you may be getting the idea that, um, that statistics and research design are very closely linked. And you'd be right, they really are. And part of what I've got to try and do for you is to get you clear on how that works, how research designs are linked to the kinds of statistics you can use. As I said earlier, statistics won't save you at all if you've got a really poor research design. You have to know what research design you're going to have in order to choose the right test of significance. So it's very important to decide what kind of study you're doing. Right? One of those decisions is one that I mentioned earlier, between experimental work and observational work, for example. You've got an experimental design or an observational design, but there's more to it than that as well. So what kinds of research design are there? Well, looking at it from a statistical point of view, we have, first of all, things that are called independent design. Sometimes these are called between groups designs for reasons you should see in a minute. And this is where you've got two, or sometimes more than two, different groups of people or things. We'll stick with people because it's easier to think about. So two different groups of people or more doing a task under different conditions. So it's like the um, French, students learning French, one group by a video method, one group by an audio method. You've got two quite different groups of students, one group learning by video, one group learning by audio. Right? So that would be an independent group's design. The two groups are quite different. And you can extend that, of course, to other, um, other things. You might have a third method of teaching. Now, opposed to independent groups designs are what are sometimes called correlated designs, where the subjects who do the tasks are the same or very similar. So you've got the same group of people doing two or more different things. Right? Quite different from the first design, where you had different groups of people doing the different two main subtypes of that design. One that we call repeated measures. There you've got the same group of people doing both conditions or all conditions of the test. So it might be, for example, um, a group of students doing a comprehension test, a reading test, and a translation test. Something like that. Okay, so all the three tests are being done by the same group of people. So it's repeated measures. You're measuring three different things on that same group of people. Now sometimes, of course, you can't do that. You can't ask a group of people to learn something about the French past historic by one method and then say, okay, forget it. That's it. You know, you've got to learn by another method now. You teach them by another method. You can't do it, obviously, in learning kinds of tasks at all. So that kind of design simply wouldn't be an option. 
But matched pairs would, that's the other kind of correlated design, here you don't have the same people doing two or more different things. You have very similar, closely matched people doing it. So what you try to do is, first of all, you think, think up all the factors that you think are going to be important in determining the outcome of what you're doing. Might be sex, age, aptitude, motivation, all those things that we discussed earlier and so on from the language level. And then you try to find pairs of people who are closely matched on some or all of those things. Right? So you might find two male students um, with uh, high aptitude and high motivation, for example. And those, that pair would behave statistically as if they were the same person because they're closely matched on the things that you think are going to matter. So you try to get as many pairs as you can who are matched on as many factors as possible. And you can imagine that's not easy to do unless you've got a really rather large group of people, pool of people to, to go at. So match pairs designs are not very common, I would say. More common would be repeated measure designs where they're possible. Now, again, you may say, well, why is that important in a statistical context? It's because there are different tests, different hypothesis tests, for independent groups' designs and for correlated groups' designs. So you have to know which design you've got in order to choose the right test. Okay, so it's really very important to know which design you've got. I say the main distinction is between one group of people doing multiple things or different groups of people doing those multiple things. That's what this means. By now you may be beginning, beginning to feel this is all very kind of tightly controlled but um, you really have to it's, it's like stepping on eggshells, you know, you, you, you have to be so careful about what you're doing that um, you never get to the end. Well, yes it is, and you do have to think extremely carefully. But there are more open-ended kinds of method in statistics as well. For instance, um, if you've done a hypothesis test and you've found uh, a particular and significant difference, that may lead you on to other hypotheses. Often, one hypothesis can grow out of another once you've confirmed it. So the process of generating and testing hypotheses is potentially open-ended. But the other thing to bear in mind is what I've already mentioned a couple of times to you, um, but not using the jargon. Remember the Douglas Fiber thing again, with the lots of texts and lots of um, lots of uh, linguistic features of each text. There, you can use what are called multivariate techniques, and you can use it to explore that very rich, very big data set. So when you think of it, you, you've got a huge table there, haven't you? A table which has along the top the number of the text, perhaps there are two or three hundred texts. Down the side you'd have the linguistic features that have been measured, and each of the boxes in that very big table would contain a score of some kind. And you can explore that kind of very rich, very complex data, and try and find patterns in it by means of statistical techniques, like what things go together, which texts are most alike, how can I group the texts, into text types. And so, on. so again, those are more exploratory, more open-ended. You're not there testing a hypothesis so much as trying to find patterns in the data. So these multivariate techniques then are used for isolating patterns in data sets that have been classified a number of times according to a number of different variables. And here's the 
the Bible work that I've mentioned before, um, using multivariate analysis on a large number of texts and a large number of linguistic properties. And what Biber comes up with at the end of that is a number of dimensions on which texts vary. And each dimension clusters together a number of linguistic features. Here are some names for you, that's all there'll be at present. Uh, factor analysis is one uh, multivariate technique which is used a lot when you've got, uh, inter if you've got ratio data or interval data. <coughs> cluster analysis, where things are brought together into clusters which have similar properties. Something called principal components analysis and something called multidimensional scaling. And at the end of our session yeah. tomorrow morning, I'm going to try to look at two of these with you in a little bit more detail, cluster analysis and multidimensional scaling. So, you may think, well, you know, surely that's all there is to it. We've, we've covered so much so far that <coughs> we must have mentioned everything that was worth mentioning. No, I'm afraid not. It's a complex area. There are plenty of other things I haven't mentioned. I have mentioned correlation already, um, so this is not a new one, but it's uh, something I haven't concentrated on particularly. Regression is a word I haven't mentioned, but I have told you about it, though you may not have realized that I was talking about regression. Do you remember when I said that um, we could predict which particular, sorry, not we could predict, we could find out which particular variables predict <coughs> best the scores of the test, for example. Remember the language test where we had um, students differing in, say, age, aptitude and motivation? And we measured, we know about their attitude and motivation, we know what sex they are, and we can find out which of those variables is best at predicting how well they'll do on the test. That's done by means of techniques which are called regression techniques. That can get really quite complex, um, and I've not got time to go into it this morning. Analysis of variance, we have mentioned. Um, once in the example that I gave you, that's used to test the difference in means, difference in averages of more than two samples, and lots of other more advanced techniques as well. So these at present will be just names to you, I realize this, I don't expect you to know anything about them. We are going to look at some of them in more detail uh, in what follows. So what do you do now? Well, obviously, stay away. <laughs> That's hard. Um, and read an introductory text. And I do stress introductory because one of the worst things that can happen, I think, is that if you're a, if you are a complete beginner to all this, and it is difficult stuff, if you try an advanced text straight away, you'll get very put off. If the advanced texts are really too advanced, I think, for you to, to, to start off with. If you already know quite a bit of statistics, fine. The, the thing by field covers, I mean, Andy Field, that covers both of you, in that he does start from a low level. Um, the bibliography that I've given you on your handout is intended to guide you to, to see which text might be uh, most appropriate. The, the, the bibliography is at the end of the course summary. You, some of you might find it useful to download a book that I wrote in 1985, which is freely downloadable from the, from the net. I don't, um, I don't say that this is a wonderful introduction to, to statistics, but it is intended for linguists, and it is intended for people who are a bit afraid of maths, which covers, covers a lot of people, I find. Um, it's a bit out of date, it's very basic, um, but it is available to you on the web, and I think on your handouts I've put the web address where you can actually download these. <coughs>
people have said that they find it useful as an introductory text, just to get the main ideas and the main texts. Right, that's it. So we do have about seven minutes, I think, left. So if you do have any questions, then I'd be only too pleased to try to answer them. Um, you said at one point if the difference between the groups is very big, yeah. like 40% to yeah. 80%, then you can be pretty confident it's a real difference. Okay, we all feel that intuitive. I know. Um, however, when that kind of result arises, one often finds researchers saying, well, I don't need statistics to know that that's a, a big difference. How do you respond to that? I think if it were as big as 40 versus 80, and you'd done your, you'd really done your job properly, and that you would try to um, eliminate all sorts of other possible contaminating factors and so on, if you've got a really good research design, and you've got a difference of 40 and 80 percent, then I think it, it's um, it's a formality to go through the statistics. I'd do it. I'd do it because um, I don't want uh, some reviewer who doesn't like me coming back and saying, oh, why don't you do this? <laughs> 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 so I do it. <laughs> but you'd be very likely to find that it was. But the trouble is, how big does it have to be in order to say that? And that's why I always advise you to do it anyway. I mean, I just gave you a, a rather ridiculous, whoops, rather ridiculous um, spam there. But, the, the, the best thing to do is err on the same side. Are you beginning to be able to think statistically? <laughs> <laughs> there have been some really, really important ideas this morning, and one of the really important ones that I want you to carry through into the rest is the difference between a sample and a population, and the implications that has. Uh, you're not really interested in just the sample you're taking, but in the wider population. And that really is why we need the statistical tests. Yes? Well, one thing that also worries me is how to make that sample significant or whatever, because it has to be a random sample. And sometimes you can't do that. That's, that's true. That's true. Yeah. One thing I perhaps should have mentioned is that. Strictly speaking, your samples should be random samples, and by random I really mean random. I don't mean saying, oh, I'll have that one, and I'll have that one. You know, it's not yeah. like picking sweets out of a jar, um, because you've got biases operating that you don't know about. So there are ways of choosing really random samples. The easiest one is to number each of your the people or things that you're interested in, on bits of paper, put them in a hat, shake them up, and draw them out. But there aren't random number tables that will allow you to do it. Yeah. Now, often, you can't do that. But what you can do, for example, let's imagine you have 50 students uh, in a class, and you wanted to um, do two different types of thing with them and see which was best. Then you could allocate those 50 randomly to two groups, right? So any given person has an equal chance of appearing in either group. And that would be a good way to, to achieve at least randomization within the available group of students. But statistics is full of, um, practi practical use of statistics is full of imperfections. You know, you often can't have an absolutely ideal situation. And then you have to make it as ideal as you can. And I think when you're writing it up, say in what ways it perhaps isn't absolutely ideal. And you have to make sure that your research design is, is as clear and as, as transparent as it can be, and this is an appropriate one. And then choose the appropriate tests. And, but it, people tend to think of statistics as being a very precise kind of thing. In some ways it's as much of a, uh, an art as a science. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, when you've got these numbers at the end, and you prove something to be statistically significant, you've still got to interpret it. Okay? It, it, no amount of, uh, of SPSS 
or anything else will actually do the real work for you of interpreting the, of interpreting the results you've got. And in doing that, you have to be aware of any imperfections in the design that you, not necessarily that you could have done anything about them, but it's best to be upfront about them. But it is a worry, yeah. I was now thinking that randomization sometimes collides with the fact that sometimes you need to control yes. certain yes, it, things. Yes, it so does. It does yeah, indeed. How do, you, how do you do that? How do you balance right. between... I've been saying, haven't I, that you should try to control for any variables that might be operative that you're not interested in, right? Now, the ultimate there, the ultimate way to do it would be what's called a stratified random sample. And that is that you, first of all, stratify <coughs> your, um, your available informants, your students, let's say, according to certain criteria. So you say things like, I'm going to make sure that I have an equal number of males and females in the two groups. But I'm also going to make sure that of those males and females, um, they have a similar <coughs> range of aptitude. And I'm also going to make sure that they have similar um, exposure to other languages. Mm -hmm. And the finer, the, the more variables you introduce, the fewer people you will have in each little box. Right? And within those boxes you can allocate them randomly. But the, the more distinctions you try to control for, the fewer people you've got that are corresponding to each set of distinctions. So it's a trade-off between the two things, really, between getting enough people to be able to do some kind of randomization mm -hmm. and, um, and, and, and trying to control for contaminated variables. Uh, that's why I say it's as much of an art as a science in some respect. Anything else? Right, well, what it is? Yeah, I think it's time for our strong talk.